Good afternoon, and thank you for being here for today's Competitive Enterprise Institute Policy Forum on the supply side snafu. I'm Ian Murray, Vice President here at CEI, and your host today, pinch hitting for our President Kent Lassman. First of all, let me explain the title of the forum. I'm sure we've all noticed that it's a bit more difficult to get things these days. Either things aren't in stock at all, like paper towels at my local discount wholesaler a couple of weeks ago, are taking longer to ship or are more expensive, which is a sure sign of restricted supply. Just this weekend, I tried ordering some more pellets for our kitty litter system, which are normally delivered in two days uh, to find out that they wouldn't be here until Thursday. Then this morning, I got an updated delivery notification. In normal times, that would probably mean that they would ar be arriving sooner than expected. Today, it told me not to expect delivery until January the 6th. So something is going on. Many people have suggested that there's a demand shock with people's pockets books flush after not spending much during the height of the pandemic, combined with more generous social benefits from government like the $3,000 tax credit checks from COVID relief bills. That's certainly true. And it's also true that the pandemic hurt the supply side simply by making fewer workers available. However, CEI's research suggests that there have been a series of government failures here and abroad that have really hurt the supply side, made it less resilient to these shocks and just worsened the crisis. To discuss that research, I have with me today my colleagues Marlo Lewis, Sean Higgins and Ryan Young. As you will follow along with our discussion, feel free to join the conversation by entering questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and I'll try to feed them in at the most appropriate time in the discussion. Ryan, if I may start with you, people have talked about this being a problem with supply chains, but thinking about the supply side as chains isn't quite right, is it? How should we think about supply and how might government make it less resilient? I think in order to approach the issue properly, we need to think about it properly. And to that end, I think supply chains is just a bad metaphor in that we should stop using it. Um, in a chain, one link is connected only to the link directly ahead of it and to the link directly behind it. It is not connected to any of the other links. So if one of those links breaks, the entire supply chain goes kaput. But in the real world, supply chains aren't like that at all. They're more like networks or nodes or uh, Don Boudreau from George Mason University likes to use the term supply webs. In these, each point is connected to several other points. Um, and there are multiple connection points. And it's much more resilient that way because as market failures happen, and this being the real world they do, it's easier to adapt, to reroute, to make new connections, to repair old ones as they go bad. It's a little bit like uh, the internet in a way, where when you load a web page, if a website from New York gets to you in Washington or, or here in Chicago, it can go any of thousands of different routes and it can change them on a dime. If something bad happens to one route, if some server goes bad somewhere, it can reroute instantaneously. Supply networks are a lot more like that than a chain with, with just a couple of links connected to each other. It's, the world is much more interconnected than we think it is. And I think our thinking on supply chains, supply networks, thank you, um, needs to reflect that. Wonderful. And but are, are there places in this supply web where government can intervene and make things less resilient? Yeah, usually when they intervene, it's to cut people off from some of those links in the network. It's to make it's to reduce connection points to make to give people fewer opportunities and fewer ways that they can cooperate with each other, fewer ways they can compete with each other to try to give consumers better service or a better deal. And uh, it get, makes it much harder to adapt. It makes the economy less resilient when we turn inwards instead of opening up to new opportunities. And that's, that's a way of thinking that's endemic in both parties and really a healthy response to the pandemic and to the current supply chain crisis involves openness, not closing up. Marlo, if I can turn to you, let's talk a little bit about where much of our supply comes from these days, uh, China. Uh, in other words, what has been going on there and how has Chinese energy policy perhaps played a role in all of this? Well, China's exports have increased um, substantially since the depths of the, the pandemic and the lockdowns. It's about 
25% more, at least in last August versus August 2020. However, that's not enough to meet this burgeoning demand that's occurring globally because the world is coming out of the lockdown phase of the, of the pandemics. And there are constraints now generated by Chinese policy uh, that are making it harder for China to produce as much and, and ship as much uh, as global demand requires in order to be satisfied, especially in, in the holiday season. And one of those constraints is, is energy policy. Uh, uh, China faced some very severe winter weather, which increased the demand uh, for, for electricity. But at the same time, China is implementing policies that are designed to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. So all of the provinces were given orders to start reducing their, their use of coal, which is the most plentiful energy source in, in China and has been the backbone of, of Chinese manufacturing and the whole economy for decades. And then China, uh, to, some, to some extent, to uh, uh, cut off its nose to spite its face, told Australia not to, not to export any more coal to China, even though Australia is China's leading supplier because Australia was, is not satisfied with China's investigation into the origins of the COVID vaccine. Um, and so you got a situation developing where something like 20 provinces out of 31 have had to start rationing electricity. And this has caused uh, consumer prices to soar in China, or not, not consumer prices, but industrial prices for electricity to go up. And in some cases, factories even had to shut down because the only way to meet the rationing requirements was to not deliver power to factories who need it. Um, and and the, the labor force uh, in those factories has not returned to pre-pandemic levels anyway. So it was kind of a double whammy. And so that has, has helped to fuel the inflation uh, of the cost of goods for delivery, um, as, as well as put a crimp in the supply that's available coming out of China. Indeed. And things don't stop there. You know, once things uh, are manufactured in China, they need to be sold uh, to people who will import them elsewhere in the world. So Ryan, if I can come back to you, how has trade policy played into all of this? Uh, we seem to have had issues with certain products in particular, like computer chips. It, has trade policy just helped make things worse? It has in three ways. Uh, the, the most obvious one is tariffs. Their tariffs are a tax. They're a sales tax on goods. They make them more expensive. Uh, which tightens supply, consumers pay more, and it also means that they have less to spend on other things. So that's the obvious route. Um, something a little more subtle is the effect that tariffs have had on diplomacy and international relations. Uh, for example, when President Trump enacted steel and aluminum tariffs against allies like Canada and Europe, they responded in kind uh, with tariffs of their own, which had the obvious effects that tariffs have, but they also make it more difficult to work together in the pandemic response or to smooth over other diplomatic frictions as we're seeing now, especially in regards to building alliances against China. Um, and the third one I think is the subtlest one. It's also gonna be the hardest to combat going forward. And that is non-tariff trade barriers. Essentially, if tariffs are direct and unsubtle, uh, protectionists are getting smarter and subtler, and they're finding other ways to, to get in the way of people trading with each other, getting the, in the way of people cooperating. Um, Non-tariff trade barriers might include things like uh, uh, green protectionism, which I think is something that Marlo uh, might be able to comment on as well. Um, for example, we would be forbidden to import products from countries that do not meet certain environmental standards or uh, a carbon tariff has been floated by the current administration. Um, example, um, in other areas like labor, intellectual property, 
Um, there are similar restrictions geared towards that that aren't tariffs, but have the same effect as tariffs. And because these are a lot subtler, they don't show up on your receipts the way that a tax does, and they're also much harder to get rid of. Going forward, as we negotiate new trade agreements with the UK and with Europe, they're gonna, we're going to find more and more of these trade unrelated provisions and these non-tariff barriers. And in fact, the USMCA agreement that we just negotiated is 2,000 pages long. And most of those pages are non-tariff barriers and other trade unrelated provisions that make things complicated, that grease up supply networks and create a lot of unnecessary sludge that the results of which we're seeing today. When a crisis strikes, it hits harder because of all these barriers. Some people might say, but don't we have the World Trade Organization to help smooth this all over, all out? Why isn't the World Trade Organization uh, a help here? It's dispute resolution system where the U.S. has an 85% success rate in the cases it brings is currently in shambles. And the organization as a whole is, is in a very bad shape. And the Biden administration has an opportunity to rebuild it. And so far, they seem to be passing on that opportunity, which I think is a real shame. It's the dispute resolution system is a much lower cost way of resolving trade disputes over tariffs and other trade issues than, say, a multi-year trade agreement negotiation and all the corruption and rent seeking and diplomatic difficulties that go along with those. Um, so we're, we're in a bad way. The best system that we have in place is currently in very bad shape and it's not going to be repaired anytime soon. So that, sorry to rain on everybody's parade, but uh, in the short term, there's a, there's a bit of pessimism there. And I believe the Biden administration just uh, enacted new, uh, new tariffs on softwood lumber from Canada. Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? That's right. Those rates are doubling, which is bad news for anybody who hopes to buy a house anytime soon. That's that's been a long running dispute um, with Canada, an ally, and yet we're doubling our tariffs against one of their biggest exports. Sean, let's bring you in here. So, uh, so uh, the, the goods have been manufactured in China. Uh, importers have, have, have reached an agreement uh, to, to, to bring them in. So they've managed to get the, the goods out of China and have adjusted things to take account uh, of the tariffs and the uh, other trade-related barriers that, uh, that, that uh, Ryan just explained. But why are there still so many ships anchored offshore at our ports with goods in them? And why are there so many empty containers stacked up that could be used to ship goods internally? Well, the initial immediate cause was the COVID outbreak. Uh, the health concerns on that slowed everything down. Um, you know, people, a lot of people weren't working. Um, they had to come up with social distancing uh, systems uh, for you know, the work of the docks. Uh, ships where they thought people, there might be carriers on, had to be quarantined. Um, that just slowed everything down and that created backups that went all down through the supply uh, web, as Brian puts it, uh, not so much chain. And, but the other thing that happened was in the, what the COVID outbreak showed was that a lot of these, a lot of these points in, in this web were a lot more ramshackle in, uh, th than people realized. The ports uh, in the US, particularly on the West Coast, don't operate on a 24 seven basis or didn't operate on a 24 seven basis prior to this. Um, they weren't, they were far behind other ports in other countries, including quote unquote, third world countries in terms of automation and other systems. Um, there's also other problems, for example, in the US, truckers are limited by the amount of hours that they can drive. Um, all those old country western songs about you know driving for three days straight and without sleeping or anything like that um that's uh, consigned to the, the bin of history um they can only drive i believe in 11 hours within a 14 hour period um and so there's a lot of there's a there's a shortage of people to take the stuff once it starts piling up and these things just sort of compounded on each other um once the containers started piling up on the docks then you know that's further slowed things down the docks and they had to find places with containers and sometimes those are far away than the ships at sea. They couldn't quite get the containers to the ships. And so it just sort of created this cascade effect that they created all the backups down through, down through the system. Uh, uh, Marlo, uh, perhaps you can comment on uh, the, the, one of the biggest inputs into uh, distribution, which is fuel prices. Uh, what are we seeing there? And uh, what role has government played in that? Yes, uh, Malo, fuel, uh, prices, uh, fuel prices are, are soaring all around the world uh, to a great extent. Um, uh, this is due to uh, 
climate policies, the desire to uh, engineer a forced march from fossil fuels to renewables, uh, make enormous uh, strides just in the next 10 years. You know, in here in the United States, the Biden administration's vision is to reduce energy related emissions, greenhouse gases uh, by 50% or more by 2030. Um, about 80% of US energy comes from fossil fuels. So uh, that means that a great deal of current fossil fuel infrastructure, the assets have to be stranded in fairly short order. Now, that doesn't necessarily physically restrict supplies right now, although the Biden administration has attempted to do that, blocking the Keystone XL pipeline, for example, uh, putting on, sus on permanent temporary suspension, uh, uh, new leasing of gas and oil fields on federal lands. But it's the expectations, the market expectations that are created by this. Few investors or lenders want to put their money in companies that appear to lack durable assets, assets of durable value. And so basically this whole uh, net zero agenda, the Paris Treaty agenda, the Build Back Better, the Great Reset, call it what you will, um, is a declaration that the fossil fuel industries, which have supplied most of the world's commercial energy for decades, uh, have no future. And so that means there is less investment going into them right now. Now, this is actually, paradoxically, this has been good for certain oil companies because as the supply of anything contracts, and you have high levels of demand because people still have the same demands today that they did a year ago or two years ago uh, for gasoline, for home heating, oil, for propane, you know, for electric power that's generated from gas, uh, you'll see the prices go up. Uh, and we've seen the same thing happening with, with shipping. You know, I mean, uh, the price of, of shipping a container from China to the United States uh, in September was 10 times higher than it was uh, September the year before. And that's because uh, of, of constraints on supply. So the people who actually run the container ships, you know, who operate the ships, some, some people are actually getting very rich um, uh, during this uh, supply chain snar snarl. And so paradoxically, some oil companies right now have just huge profits and their stocks are going up at the same time uh, that they are facing a future in which they will have to either cease to exist or reinvent themselves as something other than a company that deals with their current core competence. It's a very paradoxical mixed up world. Sean, if I if I may get back to the one of the other inputs into the uh, in, into trucking, which is a supply of truckers. Uh, historically, the trucking industry has been very flexible and has attracted uh, people into the business uh, when they uh, w w whenever there's uh, a, a need for more truckers. You know, so so the, the the industry has responded. New truckers uh, appear. And uh, the, the issue seems to solve itself. Th that doesn't seem to be happening at, uh, at, at the moment, does it? Or it's happening to a lesser extent than we might expect. What are the sort of constraints on the uh, uh, labor supply of truckers? Yeah, it's happening, but it is happening slower than, than we would hope. We could use a lot more of them on the roads. And one of the reasons um, why it's happening slowly is because the vast majority of truckers are independent operators. They work for uh, companies that are usually more, less than five trucks, often it's just one guy who owns his own truck. And getting into the business is difficult because it's a huge capital investment. You have to get the truck, you have to be able to pay for the gas, you have to pay for the maintenance. Um, and for, for people who don't have sort of college education or sort of come out from a, a, just that sort of background, it can be a lucrative and good way to make a living, but getting into it, can, getting, in, getting past that sort of initial hump can be difficult and that's why it doesn't react as dynamically uh, as other things you can't just go into this uh, immediately the, the further problem being that 
since because of the supply chain crisis itself, um, there's a shortage of supplies and parts for manufacturers. And that means that the price of the trucks themselves has gone up. So in addition to everything else, the, the, the barrier has even gotten a little bit higher. Uh, Ryan, is there a trade angle here? Uh, I, I believe that the, there is a, a tariff on uh, what we call intermodal chassis, which is what the, uh, what the truckers uh, use to put the shipping containers on. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, in fact, one of the great innovations of the last century was the standardized shipping containers. There's actually a very good book about it, <clears throat> excuse me, that I would recommend to everybody by Mark Levinson. Um, and the nice thing about those chassis or those containers is that the same container can go on a ship. It can be lifted onto a truck. It can be lifted onto a train back and forth between all three of those modes of transportation. That's why shipping costs are so much less than they used to be. Um, but those, uh, the truck chassis that are specially made for those standardized shipping containers are currently subject to a tariff, especially the ones made in China. And it's not, it's not a small tariff, it's 220%. That is more than a tripling of the price. Uh, that was enacted at the behest of the domestic chassis industry, but they obviously haven't responded uh, to the shortage as they should have. Uh, because there is a massive shortage. It's not just the labor angle that Sean covered, and it's not just the environmental angle that Marlow covered. Uh, there is a big trade angle here. It's a 220% tariff on a very important piece of the supply network. And just simply doing away with that tariff could do a massive amount of good very quickly. We were importing about $4,000 per month before the tariff hit. And as was announced and right before it came into effect, 4,000 became 10,000. There was a huge spike. And now since about 2019, for two years, two and a half years straight now, it's been about 1,000 imported per month. In other words, it's been about a 75% reduction in how many chassis that already cash strapped truckers can afford for their trucks. This is bad news for the entire supply web. And fortunately, like I said earlier, tariffs are obvious, direct, and unsubtle. This is an easy fix, and I hope Congress acts on it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, the, the shipping containers often go by uh, by rail as well. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed in this uh, in, in this crisis is that the rail industry has adapted very well and significantly increased uh, the amount of uh, uh, the amount of tra uh, traffic that's uh, going by rail, uh, but. Unfortunately, the uh, president's uh, competition executive order, which he uh, uh, signed earlier in the year, uh, directs the Surface Transportation Board to essentially force shippers, uh, force railroads to carry shippers at below market rates. Uh, so when that's in place, uh, as I imagine the Surface Transportation Board will uh, will try to impose these uh, the, these rules uh, either later in this year or early next. Uh, then I suspect that we'll see even that uh, good adaptation uh, be cut off uh, as freight railroads uh, simply won't have the capacity to uh, uh, to, to take extra uh, extra containers anymore. So, uh, so so there's a prospect of uh, of, a, of a further snarl in the system uh, that's going on here. Uh, I'd just like to remind uh, those who are watching. But uh, that you can submit your questions at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we, uh, I will try to take uh, as many of them as possible as we go in, uh, uh, continue the discussion. Uh, but uh, let's um, let's turn to uh, a, a, a rather different question. You know, we, we've agreed that there's been a, a strong element of, of regulatory sclerosis uh, that, that's built up uh, in, in this uh, in the in the system. Um, but I worry that politicians, in fact, politicians the world over, uh, are taking the wrong lessons from the pandemic's effects on the economy. Marlow, earlier you mentioned something called the Great Reset. Uh, can you uh, describe what the Great Reset is, why so many people uh, the world over are talking about it, uh, what they have in mind exactly, and why that would be a very bad idea? Well, Ian, I'm not sure that I can explain what they have in mind exactly. Um, a lot of these things are, are Rorschach, inkblots. 
Um, but basically the idea is we've just faced a global disaster and lots of things were shut down either by lockdowns or, or, or actually directly as a result of the pandemic. And so what we should do is make sure this crisis doesn't go to waste and, and, and use it to advance policies or agendas that we always wanted governments to act on. But, uh, but now people are more frightened and feel more need for government supervision and protection uh, and are, are looking to government for an answer. And uh, a lot of people have been put out of work. So let's step into the breach. Let's not let the market rebuild businesses that already existed or economic patterns of development that were already in progress. But let's substitute industrial policies, forms of central planning, types of central planning. And so one of the ideas of the Great Reset is that um, the Green New Deal or policies like it, which um, our Congress decided was unaffordable even when we were flush and prosperous. That's why not one Senator who sponsored the Green New Deal legislation actually was willing to vote for it. But now, now that we've got the country or now that the country's on its back, let's give them a good dose of, of, of these policies. And the, 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 the real risk here is I think was well explained just a few days ago in the Atlantic by Daniel Jurgen, one of the great energy policy historians and scholars who said, who points out that this so-called energy transition that the resetters want to, uh, want to advance is unlike any energy trans, uh, transition in history. All the previous energy transitions were really energy additions. You still had, you still had uh, a lot of energy produced from wood when coal started to phase in. You, you still had a lot of coal-based energy when when the economy shifted more and more to oil. Um, you had nuclear and natural gas then added, layered on top of the others. Now the idea is let's just take everything that is a legacy energy uh, from fossil fuels and let's just get rid of it and put renewables in its place. And, and, and let's do it really fast. Um, the idea is to basically get a carbon neutral economy by 2050. And as Jurgen points out, the global economy by 2050 could be more than twice as large as it is now, which means it's going to have a significant increase in overall energy consumption. And the energy, uh, the International Energy Agency came out with a study in May that is highly recommended. It's fantastic. It's all about energy transitions or the clean energy transition. And what they point out is that what the clean energy transmission, it, transition is fundamentally is a shift from a fuel intensive energy system to an, a mineral in, intensive energy system. And so the, the IEA is projecting that in order to meet these Paris goals, the goals of the, of the Great Reset by 2050, or even later than 2050, if it's, if it's in the developing world, that by 2040, the demand for various rare, uh, various energy transmission, excuse me, energy transition minerals has to increase dramatically. So a 700% increase for rare earth elements, 1900% increase for nickel, 2500% increase for graphite, and a 4200% increase for lithium, which is now the mainstay of, of batteries for all smart technology, but also for electric vehicles. And the problem here is, or there, there are multiple problems, but the, the immediate problem is that the mining and processing infrastructure, call them supply webs, if you will, to meet that kind of demand do not exist. And it is very hard to spin them up 
on short order because one of one of the facts that the IEA points out, and I think this is what this is a fact that people should remember if they remember anything that I said in this presentation, is that on average it takes 16 years between the discovery of a new mineral deposit and actual production. Well, 16 years from now is 2035, which is when uh, the Biden administration expects 100% of our energy to come from renewable technologies or non or non emitting technologies. So you can see how we could, uh, what could easily develop is a scenario in which the demand for these energy transition uh, minerals ramped up by lavish subsidies and also pushed by mandates, this demand increases faster than available supply. I mean, right now, the, the, the really the heart of this supply chain snarl is, is that supply is greater, or excuse me, that demand is much greater than the supply that can meet it. Well, we could see that globally for the new energy economy in which government policies ramp up demand for these energy transition minerals much faster than they can be supplied. And so the International Monetary Fund recently came out with a study um, in which they are expecting, and here I just wanna make sure I have this correct, uh, that the real prices of nickel, cobalt, and lithium could rise by several hundred percent from 2020 levels. And copper, the price of copper, which is essential for all electrical equipment, could rise by 60%, and not just for a year or two, but for an entire decade. So this would not be the great transition that some people seem to think that if you can solve the climate problem, you can solve all other problems. Uh, but in, in fact, these sorts of policies would make uh, the disconnect between supply and demand much greater and much longer lasting. Uh, that, that's fascinating, Marlo. The, the, the answer to, uh, to the supply crisis is to create another supply crisis. I, I don't think that's what, uh, what, what, what the people and consumers <laughs> really want. Uh, Sean, in a second, I'm going to ask you a, a, a question about another aspect of the Great Reset, but we have a few questions from the audience uh, that, um, that, that, that I'd like to, like to get to. Um, question one, I think, is for Ryan. Uh, it's, it's from uh, Thea, Thea Tatsos, uh, uh, Calimera there. Uh, what is the history of the 220% uh, tariff, and how does that compare to other civilian or non-commercial non vehicles? That's a very good question, and it's it's a very common story. In short, it was passed at the behest of the domestic chassis industry. Um, just a quick Google search will show you that producers lobbied for the tariff, and they they succeeded. Um, so while it, let's let's say there's a, more generally there's a there's a tariff that costs consumers a billion dollars per year. That's about thirty percent. Per American, 30 cents from me, 30 percent from or 30 cents from Ian, 30 cents from you and from everyone who's watching today. Nobody's going to storm Washington, D.C. and hire lobbyists over 30 cents per year. But for the handful of chassis producers, they can have millions or even tens of millions of dollars at stake each. That makes investing in a lobbyist and in some campaign contributions well worth the money. Um, in fact, corporate welfare as a whole, uh, something Fred Smith and I examined boy, almost a decade ago at this point, can have a return of as high as 30 to 1, which is astounding. It, on the stock market, 10% is a fantastic return. And here we're talking about 3,000%. So the question is, why isn't there more of this? So to the answer to where do the chassis tariffs come from, the same place most tariffs come from. They're lobbied for by domestic producers who claim that they're being undercut and they can't compete against foreign industries. Um, given the ingenuity and talent that people have in this country, I don't think those stories hold ground. So hopefully we can succeed in uh, maybe seeing through the broader interests beyond the 30 cents that come out of our pocket for tariffs like this one and hopefully convincing the administration and Congress to do something about tariffs. 
Um, we, we have some other questions from Christine and Jeff, but I think that, that, that they, they, they're better uh, asked slightly later in, in, the, in the presentation. So, uh, Sean, to get, to get back to you, uh, can you comment on the prominence of labour policy uh, in the Great Reset or the Build Back Better agenda? Yeah, why is it so central and what will be the likely effects? Well, organised labour has made a particularly strong bid in the last two decades or so, uh, particularly under Richard Trumka's um, direction at the uh, the AFL-CIO, um, to, to be much more political, much more politically oriented, to get much more of, of a str stronger hand in Washington, D.C. And that's because they believe the future and the survival of organized labor is built on changing the laws that govern organized labor. They want to rewrite the National Labor Relations Act to simply get rid of right-to-work states. Um, they want to rewrite all the, all the rules for organizing to favor them, essentially to, to get rid of all the sort of things that allow uh, businesses to uh, present an alternate perspective to workers and get them, dissuade them from, from joining unions. In terms of their prominence with this sort of great reset in energy policy, um, it seems a bit, it seems odd at first glance because a lot of uh, work union or, or union um, organized uh, industries are in the fossil fuels, I mean, coal mining and such. But those industries have sort of shrunk and as a consequence, um, the worker base in, the, in them has shrunk. And a lot of the organized labor now is uh, public sector and uh, it's a lot of uh, sort of white collar and service sector jobs have become much more prominent. So those old, old line things don't have as much power as they used to. But in this new sort of great reset and with all the sort of federal government activity and funding that's gonna be going into it, they see a role for creating themselves as uh, the sort of beneficiaries in terms of the jobs that are created. They want essentially the rules when they're created to, to create these uh, requirements for new clean energy to favor them in terms of how uh, workers are hired. So that's why they're so prominent there. Uh, I, I want to explore two other uh, 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 political reactions to the, the current crisis. And uh, the, the, the first is, uh, we've seen it from uh, Elizabeth Warren and others, uh, which is to claim that the, um, uh, the, 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 the price rises and the empty shelves are simply a result of uh, corporate greed. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Chairman Lena Khan of the FTC uh, is ordering Walmart, Amazon, Kroger, and other large wholesalers and suppliers uh, including Procter & Gamble, Tyson's Food, Kraft, uh, Heinz. Uh, she's ordering them, and I quote, to turn over information to help study causes of empty shelves and sky-high prices. Uh, if any of you want, 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 want to tackle uh, that, that, that question, what, what's likely to the, be the result of that investigation? Um, not much, because they're going to find that they're basically just Caught up, caught up by the crisis as much as anybody else. I mean, these are retailers. These are people who sell products to the public. A supply chain crisis is a crisis for them. It means that they don't have the products that they want to sell. They can't make the money they do. They either have to raise prices or they don't have uh, items sold or they have to find alternates. Um, and in fact, a lot of them are have reacted very heavily to uh, the supply chain crisis by, by trying to sort of circumvent and, and, and find other ways around it. Going back to Ryan's point about the sort of the web uh, in using that as, as a means to sort of get around it. They're certainly not causing the crisis, um, uh, at least not the, re the, the end sort of retailers because it just doesn't benefit them. I mean, it's just an added cost that they have to deal with. Now, having said that, are there other people within this sort of web that are benefiting and profiting at the moment? I'm sure there are. I mean, that's, this always happens in, in a crisis of that nature. But the entities that, to which the FTC has directed its attention to at the moment I mean, it says it's not an investigation. They're just asking questions. But, you know, when you get a, when you get a letter from the FTC, it's not really a request, um, however, it's, however it's phrased. Um, so, but th they're, look, they're looking at the wrong end if they're, if they're looking at this from a prosecution standpoint. On the other hand, if they are just genuinely um, looking for information and trying to understand the sort of the origins of it, these actually retailers may actually have some things that they could tell them that would, that would sort of clarify, you know, what, what went on and how the how the dominoes start to fall. That, to piggyback on what Sean is saying, I think there are two components. In the short run, uh, we're looking at an instance of theater. I don't think it will result in legislation. I don't think it will result in substantive action by the FTC in the near term. I think it's they're doing it for show so that the public thinks that Washington is doing something. 
in the longer run, I think uh, Ch FTC Chairman Lena Khan's objective is to sway public opinion against uh, business in general. And so by uh, saying that she's investigating businesses and being able to cast aspersion on them and on their motives, uh, she's laying the groundwork for longer term actions, uh, possibly in the future. And, and even a lot of the uh, antitrust cases she's going after against big tech and other industries, some of which Ian, you have covered. Um, a lot of it is uh, taking on cases that maybe she doesn't expect to win, but she does expect to uh, turn public opinion against uh, businesses large and, and maybe even small. Uh, yeah, Ian, if I could follow up on, on both uh, Sean and, and Ryan, this is a long established familiar pattern the FTC under various administrations has conducted umpteen, I mean, it's, it's well more than a dozen, it may be more than two dozen investigation of oil companies. Whenever oil and gas prices spike, uh, they're always looking for some kind of collusion to gouge the consumer. And in every case, they end up with, uh, with, with empty. They're running on empty because uh, the price of gasoline is mostly a reflection of the price of oil, which in turn is a global commodity. So it's all a matter of supply, <clears throat> supply and demand. But alleging uh, corporate skullduggery makes for, uh, makes for political theater, it's, it's uh, demagoguery. And I think the, the, the uh, concerning factor here is that this is no longer reserved for the big bad oil companies. As Ryan says, uh, this is an attempt to somehow discredit um, American enterprises in general. At least in the them case, appear to be the enemies of the people. At least in the case of the energy industry, it is the, the, the people who are producing producing the product. In this, in this particular case, they're looking at retailers, people just sell the end, the end use product not people who actually create the stuff. So it's even less cause. Yeah. Uh, the, the, that question about the FTC, by the way, was, was from, uh, from Christine. I have a question uh, related uh, specifically to, uh, to energy policy for Marlow from uh, Nathan Lord. Uh, he, he's talking about uh, Bjorn Lomborg's uh, Wall Street Journal article uh, about a month ago, where he stated that the cost to get to net zero uh, would be for each person per year around $11,000. So he asks, does it matter if the supply crisis is fixed or not? Because consumers will have to spend all their money on energy transition costs, reducing the, the demand for goods in general. <laughs> well, yes, that was a wonderful article that Bjorn Lomborg wrote. And he was referencing, he, Lomborg, was referencing a study that was published in Nature Climate, uh, climate Change. Uh, and the authors there were trying to determine what it would actually cost to get to net zero by 2050. And since most economists believe that the least costly way to do it would be through a global carbon tax rather than through various mandates and subsidies, um, that, it, that even a carbon tax of say $1,500 a ton, which would add maybe $14 to the cost of a, a gallon of gas, that that would be insufficient. That would only get you to 80% carbon, uh, carbon reduction rather than get you all the way to zero. In fact, I don't think they, they could find a carbon tax high enough to get you all the way, but you could get 95% of the way to carbon neutrality with a carbon tax higher than $1,500 a ton. And that would, that would turn out to be an expense of uh, $4.4 4 trillion a year in 2050, just here in the United States, uh, which would um, equal something like 11.9% of US GDP at that time. And Bjorn's point is, well, this is how one of my favorite climate scientists, John Christie, put it. If it's not economically sustainable, it's not sustainable. In other words, they're all right now in our in CEI's latest poll, about 40% of the of the people surveyed, of the voters surveyed, 
said they would be unwilling to spend more than one dollar a month to combat climate change. So, you know, uh, imposing these horrendous costs on people will not be tolerated, at least not in a free society. So as long as we remain free, I think that it won't happen. Uh, I'd like to uh, just, just switch gears here and look at the other side of the political aisle. Um, many on the right, I'm afraid, are saying in uh, response to this, uh, this crisis that uh, the current scenario shows that just-in-time delivery systems failed, free trade was a mistake, we should onshore everything to ensure that uh, we have domestic supply chains and that this doesn't happen again. Uh, Missouri Senator Josh Hawley, for example, has a bill that says 50% of basically anything the Commerce Department designates should be made with American source materials and components. But isn't that just as short-sighted as a Great Reset, Ryan? Yeah, I think part of that is, uh, frankly, from sloppy thinking about supply chains, thinking of it as a chain with links that can break and are, and are difficult to fix. Uh, the thinking goes, uh, you know, for rare earth metals that we need for circuits and smartphones, what if China cuts us off? Uh, what if... Uh, you know, the, net, the big steel tariffs that we are currently enduring are, were enacted on national security grounds. We need to have a strong domestic industry for national security reasons. We can't be dependent on foreigners. What if an enemy cuts us off? Um, I understand those arguments, and yet I disagree with them because they think of supply chains as chains. They're networks with nodes that can adapt and reroute. The, in a global market, you can't be cut off from anything, whether it's oil or steel or rare earth elements. Um, and so what they're proposing instead due to their, their chain thinking um, is to give Americans fewer nodes and fewer ways to adapt, fewer ways to reroute, uh, a, a less refined division of labor, which means less specialization, which means less innovation and lower productivity, uh, fewer opportunities to compete, fewer opportunities to cooperate, fewer opportunities to to outcompete and make money out in the global market as well as the domestic market. It's just misguided policy all around. And I think it's rooted, um, well, as in with Lena Khan, with political theater in parks, I don't expect Holly's proposal to gain tit cane ground, um, but also in just misguided thinking about trade. It's not a supply chain, it's a network. We're all interconnected and we need to realize that if we want to have effective policy responses to the situation we're in. Yes, yeah, so the reality of the supply web is that even the humble pencil can be bought for that can be bought for just a few pennies at the grocery store is made from materials sourced all over the world, and that's actually why it's so affordable and ubiquitous. Uh, CEI actually has a video explaining this that you can find at our website. It's called I Pencil. In fact, President Biden tried to explain this a few weeks ago, but managed to stumble over the concept. In fact, uh, our colleague uh, Sam Kasman called his uh, explanation I Crayon. But we have, uh, we, we have about, uh, just under 10 minutes left. And uh, I want to get to that question from uh, Jeff Mordock from the Washington Times, which is, you know, what should the US be doing right now to get that to solve the supply chain crisis that it's not currently doing? Uh, if each of you could give me uh, you know, just one policy that you'd like to see adopted that would help us get books, uh, goods back on the shelf at a lower price, I think that would answer, help answer that question. Sean, why don't you go first? Well, I'm fond in these situations of quoting a, a line Ronald Reagan was a, fond of using, which is, don't just do something, stand there. Um, in terms of the question of what the government should be doing, not a heck of a lot. I mean, we talked a little bit about the FTC investigation and how that's likely theater and probably spinning wheels. It's, it's unlikely to get a whole lot uh, of new information. And the other thing we need to understand is that this crisis was very nearly much more worse because of regulations. California's AB5 law would have severely restricted the number of truckers on the road. Um, that part of the law was stayed. Um, they're waiting to see how this works out in the courts right now. And for the moment, it's not applying. But if it had, it would have meant that you couldn't be a trucker and work independently um, or was severely restricted the ability to do that and required you to actually do it you know, for, for a company. And that would have just limited the number of people on the road. So the, the, the snarls would have just been even worse. And in the PRO Act, um, they have a national version of the same law, which would have done the same sort of thing. So yeah, the, the, in terms of the, what the government should be doing, just let the invisible hand of the market work, its, work itself. 
you know, work this out. It's already doing that to a large extent. I mean, they're re is the rerouting a lot of this stuff uh, to, to get more more goods. They're using different ports. They're using smaller ships. Com the big retailers are getting more involved in the logistics works themselves and putting their knowledge to work to, to find uh, you know alternate routes, alternate sources, alternate materials. And this crisis was could have been much worse. In, and it hasn't been because of that reason. And we just seem to need to sort of allow this stuff to happen, to work its, to work its way through. Marlo, what, 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 what's your th thoughts? There are, a, there is a group of 15 Republican governors that are proposing, for example, to uh, lift restrictions on the driving age of commercial truckers. Uh, I guess in, in many states, um, <clears throat> or maybe even nationwide, it's it, the minimum age is 21. I, I was trying to get hold of, the, uh, of their proposal again to check those facts. But anyway, one of their proposals is to lower the age from 21 to 18. There are plenty of 18 year olds who are capable of, of, of driving uh, with skill and alertness and anything that would, uh, that would increase the supply of truck drivers. So I guess I'll add another one. Uh, right now, uh, our national policy severely restricts the opportunity for Mexican truck drivers to haul freight in the United States. That's, that's crazy. Um, you know, uh, we, have this, we have this trade agreement with Mexico and Canada and part of it covers services, but somehow the service of truck drivers did not make it into the free trade zone uh, yep. among our three countries. And, and that, should be, that should be changed. But all of, unfortunately, all of these changes, like another one would be getting rid of the Jones Act, uh, which would revive our domestic maritime industry because the Jones Act literally protected the US maritime coastal industry out of existence or virtually out of existence, but all of these things would take time and, uh, and it would probably help a great deal in future supply crunches, but I'm not sure how much immediate relief anything the government does can do, but the government shouldn't make it worse. And so I think I'll end with a, a suggestion by one of our colleagues, Mario Loyola, who, uh, who basically says we need to kill this bill, meaning the big uh, reconciliation bill, which he says, quote, will inject trillions of dollars into the demand side of an economy that is already overheating like an engine with a broken radiator. And so that won't help. Spending more money that we don't have won't help. And that's something they cannot do tomorrow. And it'll come too late also. Brian, uh, let's give you the last word on, on policies that can be, uh, that, that, that perhaps government could enact now that would, uh, uh, would help alleviate this. Yeah, that was well played, Sean. <laughs> um, when there's a crisis, whether it's COVID or the supply chain, uh, the supply network crisis we're going through now, there's a natural instinct to close down. I understand that impulse, but what we need to do is not close down. We need to open up. Resilience comes from openness. So if you want one policy to do that, scrap the Biden and Trump tariffs. Just get things back to where they were in 2017, 2016. Even that's not ideal, but it's doable. It can be done at the stroke of a pen. Um, as we go forward, I think what we need to do negotiating trade agreements with the UK and with Europe and with others is to have trade agreements stick to trade keep all those trade unrelated provisions out of there. That's how you keep those sneaky non-tariff barriers that are so subtle to find and so difficult to get rid of out of trade policy. Those might not do much to today's supply network crisis, but something's gonna happen in the future and that's a way to keep us resilient against whatever happens next. So it's important to think short-term, get rid of the tariffs and long-term, have trade agreements stick to trade. Yeah, that's something even Paul Krugman uh, would agree with. Uh, uh, he wrote a, a wonderful article in the 1990s saying that trade negotiators should stick to trade and not uh, include things, about, uh, uh, side agreements or full-fledged full agreements about uh, labor and environmental policies, uh, for instance. So I, 
I'd, I'd advise everybody who uh, is a fan of, uh, of Paul Krugman on this call uh, to go and read that, uh, that, that article of his from the 1990s. We have actually time for one more question. Uh, and it's from some bloke named Kent. It's how does the current supply chain mess relate to economic and social indicators like consumer sentiment, which shows that consumer confidence has been falling all year, or the consumer confidence index from the OECD, which after about a year of recovery from the depths of the pandemic, shows steep decline. Any of you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think Kent is alluding to the old animal spirits argument. Um, something I've been saying for a while is that the economic recovery from COVID has to do with how safe people feel. The more people get vaccinated and the more cases go down, the faster the economy recovers. The fundamentals are pretty good right now, aside from inflation. It's just you'll notice that the indicators and consumer sentiment zigs and zags along with the caseloads and how the, the pandemic is going. That's why I think the new Omicron variant is going to throw a wrench in the works for as long as it's around. Um, but you'll notice with Delta, as it came and then as it went, that's how consumer sentiment and that's how economic performance went. Once we do conquer COVID, once enough people get vaccinated and we feel safe again to open up, we will, because the fundamentals are strong. We're, we're doing all right. We just have to get through this. Uh, Sean Amalo, do you have anything to add to that? I don't think I can say it any more eloquently than Ryan just did. And I'll second that motion. Excellent. Well, thank you all for your insights and to all of you in the audience for joining us today. Uh, when the event closes, you'll receive a short survey from us. Uh, if you can donate some of your time to us by filling that in, it will help us improve our service. Uh, talking of which, we have two events next week which are equally worthy of your time. On Tuesday, uh, the 7th of December at noon, we'll have a policy forum on uh, pensions, retirement and ESG, uh, Environmental, Social and uh, Governance Investing, uh, which will feature uh, the former Labour Secretary, Jean, Eugene Scalia, uh, the prominent lawyer, Tom Christina, and CEI's own experts, uh, Richard Morrison and Dan Greenberg. Later the same week, on Thursday, uh, the 9th of December, again at noon, we'll have a book forum with author Tony Woodleaf talking about his forthcoming work I Citizen, a blueprint for reclaiming American self-governance. I'm sure you want to attend both of those. So thank you again for attending. I'm Ian Murray, and this has been the CEI Policy Forum.